that is left. Let me show it to you, and then I will show you the seven secrets. Okay, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. Revelation 7, verse 9. And I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, from all nations, from all kindreds, from all people, and from all tongues. We call Revelation 7, 9, the end game or the end vision. That's God's final vision. God has seen how everything will end. And he didn't see a few people making heaven. He didn't see just a couple of thousands of people making heaven. What he saw, he put it down for us. This is God doing vision casting. A great multitude that could not be numbered coming from all nations and all kindreds and all people and tongues and they stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. In other words, these are the ones that made it to heaven. They are now standing before the throne, not on earth, in heaven, clothed in white robes. If you read further down, he said they will never test again. The Lamb will walk in the midst of them and all of those things. There will be no more pain, no more sorrow. They've made it. Multitudes that could not be numbered. These are billions of souls. Then there was a question. Go down to verse 13. I think it was the elder, one of the elders that answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robe and where did they come from? In other words, who are they? Where did they come from? And John answered in verse 14. He said, I said to him, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they that came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The great tribulation is the event of the last days. I'm not particular about whether it's seven years or three and a half years. I'm not in discussing that aspect now. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm discussing the perilous times of these last days. The times we're living in are troubling times. The times we're living in are perilous times. But the Bible said, the harvest of souls that will be won in this trouble sometimes will be numbers that could not be counted. I asked the Lord, what is the meaning of that? What exactly is going on here? Then he gave me understanding. He said, when I permitted the shakings of the nations, about seven shakings are going on, the shakings in the economy, the shakings in the health sector, all these global shakings that are going on, the purpose is to drive men to seek after God. The end time event is not designed to work against God's people. God is not working against his own people. It's just that the church needs understanding of the times and understanding of what Israel ought to do. That is the characteristics of the children of Israel. They had those two dimensions to understanding prophecy. They had the prophetic foresight or understanding. They had the strategic foresight. So one is understand the time, the time you are living in all the way to the future. The other one is understand what we are supposed to be doing. The shakings, the perilous times, and all of this has purpose. For the enemy, Satan, he's doing all this because he has a short time. He wants to destroy lives, take many people to hell. But on our own side, God Almighty is permitting all of this so he can use it to push the largest number of people towards finding Christ. What does that mean? It means that while the end time shakings are going on, we, God's people, should now be strategically positioned to gather the harvest that are the result of this. This is one of the strategies that uh, the hunters use in hunting animals. Whenever there is a bushfire, the bushfire causes all the antelopes the bush means the rabbits and all the, these other animals to start running out of the bush because they are running for safety. Now, as these animals are running out, all that the hunters have to do is to surround the bush and position themselves to harvest what is coming out. 
That's what God expects us to do. The entire shake is like a mighty wind shaking the trees in the forest, shaking the trees of the nation, shaking people, shaking nations, and then the ripe fruits are falling. Our job is to come with the baskets and all other instruments of harvest and gather the fruits. So, you see, in the last days, we have to be we have to understand what the Lord is doing and be positioned right. We are not to be overtaken with fear and get disoriented and operate like the children of this world. The Bible said you are not in the darkness that that day will overtake you like thief. You are not children of the dark. You are children of the light. We are supposed to know what the Lord is doing and then partner with him because he is head of the church. We are his body. We are supposed to be walking in sync. Meanwhile, I, every time I read the book of Revelation, I'm reminded that Jesus is the one holding the book that has all the historical and prophetic records. And every time he opens one seal, a series of prophetic events begins on earth. So it is our master that is in charge of history. Is our master that is in charge of prophecy. Is our master that is in charge of the last days. Let us have confidence and rest and align ourselves with heaven. It's what is called divine alignment. Find out what he's doing and then make sure that we align with him to see his purposes and his plans come to pass on the earth. And so, with that, we are set to now look at this seven. But I'll give you one more scripture. And of course, because I just talked about last day's harvest, Isaiah chapter 2 from verse 2 said, in the last days, you see the same period again. The same last days when he said, perilous times shall come. The same last days which are times of tribulation and turbulence. The same last days when they are shaking. It's the same time, Isaiah said, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be exalted above all the mountains and exalted above all the hills and all nations shall flow into it. I read in Revelation that harvest, this harvest uncountable number of souls will come from every nation, every tongue, every tribe, and every people. And here he said, all nations shall flow into it. Verse 3 said, and many people shall go and say, let us come to the mountain of the Lord's house, to the house of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. So you see, a lot of people are going to be finding Christ in these turbulent times that we are living, living in. And the church must be positioned to be the light in the midst of the darkness, to be the guide, to be the ones harvesting, taking advantage of what the Lord is doing, and not be confused and disoriented. Having said that, now we are going to make a little journey. I have seven bottles filled with water. I have one that is empty. That is where we will end. I'm going to take us from history and take us to the future. I'm going to put something to mark the last two bottles because the la first five is history to where we are. These last two is where we are and what where we are headed to as the body of Christ. The husband man has been exercising love and patience. Why? He's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth, the harvest of the earth. And he's going to exercise that patience till he gets the former and the latter rain. Listen, we are told that the last day's move will be the combination of everything God has done in history. It was Joel the prophet that made that clear that it's going to be the former and the latter rain in the first month. We know that the former rain came in the day of Pentecost and that launched the early church and all of the mighty things that happened. And we know that after about 500 years of that move of God, that we experience in church history what is called the Dark Ages. I don't want to spend so much time. And this Dark Age lasted for about a thousand years. It was at the beginning of it that Islam emerged. 
Islam in March about 630 AD. Because there is no vacuum in nature. If the church withdraws the light, something else will rise up. If we cease to be the people of God, something else will fill the vacuum. The purpose of God depends on the people of God. I'm going to say it again. There is a marriage between the purpose of God and the people of God. God will not come down from heaven to do it. It's his body, the church, that will carry out his purposes on the earth. So after about 500 and something years of a mighty move of God all over the world, there was a slacking. Certain things happened and went wrong. And then during that gap, Islam emerged. And then if you check the growth of Islam, it's crossed to about 1.23 billion people. Christianity is about 2.6 billion people. But the population of the earth is over 7 billion people. God is talking about the next billion harvest, the next billion after that next billion, then the next billion after that next billion. God is talking about us taking at least half of the population of the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to accomplish that, God needs the whole church to go after the whole harvest. So this is how the restoration started. 1500, the first restoration started. So I'm giving you seven major restorations in church history. And that will lead us to where we are. Let me put this glass along with these two to where we are now in the move of God. My plan is to show you what the church ought to be doing now. What the church ought to be, where we are in the plan of God, and what the church ought to be doing now. Okay, the first restoration was the Protestant re restoration. It was a Catholic monk that started that. We all know the story about Martin Luther. And it was restoration of the message of grace and the message of salvation by faith. And thank God for that. Because without that, salvation is lost. During this dark age, millions of people went to hell because the simple message of the gospel, the message of salvation, the preaching of Christ's death and resurrection and its implication for human salvation and our eternal destiny was lost. Thank God for Martin Luther and thank God for that restoration. So we got this first level restored and now I can say, if you're a child of God, if you're a minister of the gospel, if you want to be part of the end time program of God, what God is doing now is the former and the latter rain in the first move. You have to start from foundation up. God didn't say drop it because you are pursuing last day's action. So make sure that the preaching of salvation is solid in your ministry. Make sure that you are helping people find Christ, give their life to Christ, and they move on into the higher things that God has for them. Those of you who are out there preaching only grace, realize that grace is just the first step. Grace is the milk. You're not going to mature people, feeding them with milk forever. The message of grace is real. It's authentic. Except that the type some are preaching now is cheap grace. The biblical grace is costly grace. It didn't only cost Jesus. Those of us who are receiving it will later find out that it will cost you something. If anyone is going to come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and follow me. So I, I want to just leave it where Martin Luther left it. Salvation by faith. So I will move it backward here to show God has taken care of this. But everybody in all generation, last days or not, that wants to be involved in the move of God must start back there from the finished work of Christ and the salvation that it brings to mankind. Then comes John Wesley. And you know, there are institutions following every one of these restorations. You've seen Protestant churches, especially the Anglican church. Yeah. The Anglican church. Lutheran church. But my brothers and sisters who are Anglicans, you are a priest, you are a bishop, listen to me. Worldwide Anglican church is just about 80 something million. Anglicans all over the world is just about 80 something million. 
Islam is about 1.2 to 1.3 billion. So we need to find out the other things that God has done that we may not be looking at and restore it. And restore it. Don't just stay with only salvation. There is more. Okay? So we keep this one here. The next thing that was restored was by the Wesleyans. The, the Wesley brothers came on the scene and God used them mightily to restore sanctification. To restore holiness. To restore godliness. And they are the ones that helped us to discover without holiness, no eye shall see God. <laughs> Some people call it now deeper Christian life. All of us are supposed to be deeper. There's nobody that's supposed to be shallow. Nobody. It is for all Christians. There is nothing like I only believe in salvation. I don't believe in holiness. So the second restoration is about producing transformed Christians. Not just professing Christians, but practicing Christians whose life matches their profession. After by faith you're giving your life to Christ, you move to the next level to start bearing the fruit of the Spirit, to, to, to become conformed to the image of Christ. And every believer must move on to that next level. Because there are higher things that God has for you that will not be built, that will not be built on the faulty foundation. For example, let me say this. Some of these boys that are preaching grace ignore the fact that you have to back up that grace message with holy lives, with righteousness, with godliness. Do you see now? And there are people who have moved on to Pentecostal activities, speaking in tongues, and they've removed this pillar. Some don't even preach salvation anymore. Sanctification also by the finished work of Christ. <laughs> and truly, without holiness, no eye shall see God. After professing Christianity, we have to back it with practicing Christianity. So, I need to leave that. And you see the Met Methodist Church and all the work that has been done all over the world as an example of institution that that second major move of God brought. And then, of course, the Baptists came, especially the Anna Baptists, and restored to us the fact that baptism is a martial. I'm sorry for all of our friends and some of my brothers who, you know, because I too was baptized when I was small, water was sprinkled on my head, but uh, there are truths that they brought to us. They checked how Jesus was baptized. He was baptized in the river Jordan. They checked all the other people, the early church, they were baptized in water, and they brought out the fact that baptism is burial. Burial. And this is where God made separation between the Egyptians and the Jews when they went down into the Red Sea and came up on the other side. I'm just teaching you church, church history. I'm not here to argue about church doctrine. I'm not here to fight about which one you believe in. I'm telling you what God has done. Okay? It was at that point when the Egyptians tried to follow them through the water that God destroyed the armies of Egypt. Since I got this understanding, I have found that Baptism is one of the greatest tools for deliverance. Baptism is powerful. If you ask me, the enemy knocks on my door. I say, who are you looking for? He says, it's David. I say, the one you are looking for, I can take you to the spot where he was buried. Because baptism is burial. It's identifying with Christ in his death. It's also identifying with him in his resurrection. I can take you to where he was buried, where that old one that set a lauded over, the, that ruled over was buried. This one is a new man in Christ. I have risen from the dead and has taken on Christ's nature. You have no power or dominion over this. Baptism is I have crucified with him, I have died with him, I am buried with him, but now I have risen to the newness of life. And there are the full essence of that living a transformed life, living a resurrected life, living a glorified life, living in dominion over sin and all of the works of the enemy. So the, the Anabaptists helped us to restore that. Some people don't take it as serious as all the other restorations, but it is. Okay, right after that, let me come here. Then came the Pentecostal movement. 
Martin Luther's work happened in 1500, the Methodists in 1700, the Anabaptists or the Baptists in 1800, 1900, the Azusa Street Revival happened. And then uh, Charles Parham, A.J. Seymour, some of those great early Pentecostals were used by God to restore the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So you see what I'm telling you? When you give your life to Christ, get baptized in water. Not just get baptized, start living a, a sanctified or transformed Christian life. And you get to this transformed Christian life through discipleship. Through discipleship. You don't just give your life to Christ and ignore discipleship. There will be problems. You are transformed by the renewing of your mind. As you let the Holy Spirit and the Word of God do the work that they should do, your life will be completely altered. So be, giving your life to Christ is not enough. You have to grow into his image. Okay, we have the baptism in water, but now the fourth restoration is that you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You have to be baptized with the Holy Spirit because this is where another major difference is made. When the people came out of the water, the Jews, the God covered them with glory crowd. And that glory crowd stayed with them for 40 years until they led them to the promised land. So the same thing, after salvation and water baptism, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's where the power comes from. There is a big difference between the Christian that has that and the one that just gave his life to Christ that doesn't have that. There is a big difference. They are both God's children. But when you look for the power for Christian service, when you look for the power to do the works of Jesus, you see a big difference. And that if you notice, all the harvest that has come since the restoration started, once the Holy Spirit was poured out, we got more people coming into the kingdom in the last hundred and something years of Azusa because it was 1900 thereabout, something 1904, 1906. In hundred years of the restoration of the Holy Spirit, more souls were brought into the kingdom than all the 500 and something years of all the other restoration. Can you see what is going on? There is power for service. There is power for ministry. There is power to take nations. It comes when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to say this because I need to move to the fifth before I go to where we are now. A lot of Pentecostals have packed at Azusa. God has moved on. So you're supposed to get salvation, get all the foundation that the evangelical movement laid for us, get baptism, get uh, holiness, and then get filled with the Holy Spirit and move on into other things because there are still three more things ahead. Okay. Having sorted out this issue. You know, for example now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit restored to us speaking in tongues. There are at least 70 benefits of speaking in tongues. My God. Because that's one of the ways how I download revelations. I study the word of God, but sometimes some of these things block. But the person who wrote the book is the Holy Spirit. Men and women of God spake and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So I need the author to help me understand his book. When I pray in an unknown tongue, I pray in God's language. I break and gain access to God's wisdom. And when I finish, just like you have upload and download in technology, when I finish that upload, the download starts. It's like what happens with rainfall. There's evaporation and then there is raination, if you will, or rainfall. But the rain that is falling first evaporated. So when I finish upload, speaking in the language of heaven, then communication starts. That's why after a period of praying in tongues, I am quiet. And then my spirit starts picking up. 
my eyes open. I start understanding things that I'm not able to understand. The man that is filled with the Holy Spirit has greater access to knowledge of this scripture than the man that doesn't. One man is reading a book written by another man. Another man communicates with the author of the book. <laughs> there are many other things. There are many other things you benefit by doing that. For example, you know, we have the nine gifts of the spirit. Speaking in tongues is just the gateway. It's like the door into all of the rest. Paul said, I pray in tongues more than you all. So I'm recommending that because <laughs> all these restoration are for the benefits of the whole church. They are not denominational issues. Somebody may be used to do that. After all, the man that was used to bring the Protestant information was a Catholic. But the people who believe in that, who have followed that, are now Protestants. So it's not about your denomination. It's about receiving the full counsel of God. Okay, let's now move on. In the 1950s, just about 50 years from the restoration of the Pentecostal movement, God now brought further understanding, another major restoration, this time, it is the restoration of the fullness of the Spirit. <laughs> the fullness of the Spirit. Because the early Pentecostals who speak in tongues and all that, but there were dimensions of the move of God that they did not see. Let me tell you, the difference between receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit and receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit is fasting and prayer and consecration. Notice that Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit after he got baptized in water by John. The Bible says he was praying and the heaven opened and the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. That's Holy Spirit baptism. You can get that when somebody prays for you and lay hands on you. You saw that all over the Acts of Apostles, like in Acts 19, Paul prayed for those 12 efficient disciples. He laid hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's wonderful. But the moment Jesus got baptized with the Holy Spirit, he now went into the wilderness to fast and to pray and to go through a period of consecration. And in Luke chapter 4, after the fasting, in verse 14, the Bible said Jesus returned in the power of the spirit and his fame went out all over the place ladies and gentlemen it's wonderful to receive the baptism of the holy spirit but that is spirit with measure jesus moved to the level of spirit without measure there is fullness of the spirit where all of the other gifts of the spirit healings, miracles, and the rest of them start functioning in your life. And when your ministry or your Christian life hits this realm, the same thing that happened to him, your fame will go around. You start reaching far more people than you could reach at any of these other levels. Because there will be miracles, there will be healings, there will be mind-boggling results. That's why all his disciples followed suit. Let me recommend this to you. The scripture said in Acts chapter 10 verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. If they had sent him, there was the use of the hand. If I tell you to go to the fridge and bring me coke and bread, if it is coke and coke, why are we using hand? with Holy Spirit and with power. And Luke, Matthew, Mark specified the difference. John baptized him, he was praying, he got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He went to fast and power now followed. Paul was also saying the same thing, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4 to 6. My preaching is not with enticing words of man's wisdom, no motivational speaking but in the demonstration of the spirit and again and of the power of God. I have been in the journey. I have made this journey so I know the difference when I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I also know the difference when the power 
of God came upon my life and I know that it is consecration and fasting and prayer that moved me here. I know that they laid hands on me. I spoke in tongues and I, the team moved my Christian life to a higher dimension than where it was. I remember how Rehabonke came and how he, you know, that, and then prayed that mass prayer. And then fire was burning on my soul and all of that because I had that hunger to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But then beyond that, when I began to now seek God further, a higher level of anointing came upon my life. And I can tell you, men and women of God, so what happened in the 50s is that the World War ended in 1945. And a group of believers began to ask God, how come that the world is always ahead of the church? They have just discovered atomic bomb. One bomb that was dropped, it brought Hitler down and brought Germany on his knees. And then God began to show them that there are higher dimensions than what we have seen from Azusa. But that the key to that is fasting and prayer. So what happened is that a book was published in 1946, a year after the Second World War, called The Atomic Power of God. Get it, my friends. And read, you will see what I'm talking about. What is the book? He went back to teach again the principles of fasting and prayer and the principle of consecration and how to subdue the flesh so that God can rise to a higher level in you. Because John said, if I decrease, let, uh, uh, let him increase as I decrease. If the flesh fills up the place, there is no room for God to fill. If self fills up the place, there's no room for him to fill. If you want him to fill you on a higher dimension, you have to know how to decrease, how to abase self, how to die to self. And they made this discovery, and they began to teach it. And by 1946, when this started, 47, 48, now people started imagining Billy Graham, A. A. Allen, William Brown, or a robot. T.L. Osborne. And before we knew 120 mighty men of God, what we call today God's generals, a march all over the world. And then from there, it spread. That's how we got the types of Papa Idahosa and all of the ones that came down to Africa and shook up Africa. The rest of believers were now looking at them like superstars. But you see what they did, the example was set by Jesus. All of us can do it. And then we had this era of God's general that has lasted for years. But the Pentecostal movement and this kind of thing have come to and it has ended. A lot of us are not aware. Many Pentecostals are stuck. They don't know what to do. So where are we now in the plan of God? We've seen miracles. We've seen all that. Where are we? The time of the former and the latter rain. The time of the latter rain. The final hour just before Jesus returned. And we're going to see more harvest of soul in this season than what has been seen in all this. This is the time of the shaking of the nations. And at this time, what God is saying, he wants the former and the latter rain in the same month. So we've, if you've noticed, in America, all of those generals of the last 50 to 70 years have started, have transited. It's just one or two that might be left now. Where is Bonke? Heaven. Where is Oro Robot? Heaven. Where is Kenny Hage? Heaven. Where is Maurice Rulo? Heaven. Where is the Dowsers? Heaven. And I want to let you know, two years ago, the Lord spoke to me, said in the next 10 years, the transition will complete also in the continent of Africa. Many of the powerful men you know today in your country, in my country like Nigeria, are going to be with the Lord by the end of this decade. What will be the future of the church? Do you know what is going on with America now? As the generals and the fathers transit, they replace them with motivational speakers. With talkers who don't have the power of God to back them up. And this is the generation that will face the darkest hour in history. Going to do that without the equipment, without the power of God. Even in my country, the same thing is happening. There are a lot of talkers now. Imagine. Many of the fathers that we know, many of the fathers that has championed the former days, 
by the end of this decade will be in heaven. And the Lord said, you might be one or two left to help guide the coming generation. So the people now, and all we need is one generation of neglect in the church to lose everything that has happened. It happened to America. Why they were in camp meetings or robot programs and all that. They ignored their young people. They left the children. They left the youths. Those youths are now the adults. And now America is sinking, sliding down because of that. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to think about generational transition. We need to think about how to pass this mantle to the secondary school guys, to the young people in the university, to the young professionals, to the marketplace. Because the sixth move of God, this one, is about marketplace movement. What did God restore at the fifth? It is fivefold ministry. Apostle Victor and those in intercessors for Africa, I know when you started shouting this, the restoration of the apostolic and prophetic movement. Yes, this was the restoration of the 90s. This was the restoration. Now we know what an apostle is. We know what ministry gives us. We know what an evangelist is. We know what a pastor, we know what a prophet is. That's what the last thing that God finished doing. Remember that the other one was his Holy Spirit and his gift. Now it is ministry gifts. But where is the Lord now? It's not about ministry gifts. Stop praying for him to bring back the days of Idahosa or the days of a robot. That's not where it is. It is about body ministry. It's about every believer becoming part of God's end time. And here, God used a few Moses with his rod and did mighty things. Here, it is a Joshua generation. It's the whole army of God moving in the power of the Spirit, moving with the gospel. God needs the whole church to reach the whole harvest. That's where we are. It's about professionals. It's about marketplace people. It's about doctors finding their place because God has made all believers both kings and priests. It's about the priesthood of all believers. It's about priesthood in the marketplace. It's about priesthood in government. It's about priesthood in education. It's about, that's why the seven mountain message came. That's why the discipleship movement came. That's why all of these other languages we're using to add the marketplace movement came. This is where God is. Those pastors and leaders who want to still keep their people as spectators, as football watchers, why one or two person are, are displaying from the altar, they are going to miss out on what God is doing now. Arm all your people. In the days of Saul, king of Israel, it was only Saul and Jonathan that had sword. The whole army of Israel had no sword. It was so bad. First Samuel chapter 13 said, in those days, if anybody wants to get a weapon, you have to go to the Philistines. The Philistines had the technology for making smith and making metals. In Israel, there was none because Saul only armed himself and his son, Jonathan. That was why when even David was raised and he came to help the army of Israel, he had no sword. The technology was not available to every other person. He had to use his slingshot. But the moment he came to leadership, David brought a new movement where the army of Israel, the whole army of Israel was armed. He brought smith making and technology of, of making metals and weapons into Israel and armed the whole army. And the era of David's mighty men emerged. That is where we are in the church now. It's not about one superstar, one a few uh, men or whatever. You know, no, 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 no. Those who fail to equip their people are going to be I, I, I don't want to use a negative word but you are living in the yesterday of where God used to be you are living in Azusa, God has moved on you have to collect what he did with Azusa, you have to collect what he did with God's gender, but you have to move into the present day reality of the plan of God and, and maybe this is actually where I will end it because this, the seventh and the final is kingdom this is the era so the topic you gave me is about kingdom, about dominion. When I do my next session on Friday, we'll talk about it. But what will lead to that is arming the whole army. 
just like David did. It will now lead to the Israel recovering their mandate. The era of the kingdom is where, where the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. We're taking over all the sectors of the society from education to politics to governance, but it won't happen if we don't equip the lay people and equip the professionals and equip the marketplace people. And all the people in church must now be trained for last day's battle and recruited into God's end time army. May God give you wisdom. May he bless you with understanding to understand where God is. All of these things he has done in the history must be brought together now and put into this last. That's why I made the last bottle, the empty bottle. All of it must be brought and put in here because God said the former and the latter, and then we have to seek God for the unique outpouring for these last days to cap it up, and then we will have what it takes to deal with these last days and finish the tax that is left and bring the greatest glory ever to our King and our Savior. God bless you. May explosion and multiplication hit you, your personal life, your family, your ministry, your churches, as you begin to equip your people. If you're only 200 now, that 200 can become 2,000. If you can just equip them and ignite them and deploy them. If you're 2,000, that 2,000 can become <laughs> 20,000 and can become 200,000. Let's understand what the Lord is doing and what the church ought to be doing in this hour. God bless you, Apostle. Thank you for what you are doing for the church. Thank you for what you are doing for the continent of Africa. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. God bless you and Mama Africa especially. God bless you.